get right into it. We're, we're finishing up a series this month called What Happened at the Cross, okay? It, and it deals not directly with the events during the cross, but what led up to the cross and what happened because of the cross, okay? So, and, and if you're here, by the way, for the first time today, welcome. We, let, we extend our love and our greetings to you this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us today, amen? So let's get right into the Word. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. And there it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What I want to focus on here today is where it says, um, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know, the agony and the pain that he faced during and before the cross was, you know, beyond description. And yet, and yet, the Bible says that he always had joy. Yes. Jesus always had joy. So nothing deterred him, nothing stopped him, nothing um, kept him from experiencing joy. Isn't that amazing? And I feel some of us here need to experience some more joy in our lives. Okay? <laughs> some of you have been through a lot. Some of you are going through um, a lot of pain right now, a lot of difficult circumstances, a lot of major changes in your life. Uh, a lot of things are happening in your life right now, and because of those things, because you have allowed those things to take root in your heart, you've lost a lot of joy. God wants to restore that back to you today. Amen? So I'm gonna, today I'm going to be talking about the power of joy during difficult circumstances. The power of joy during difficult circumstances. Um, last week, my wife and I, we were on vacation, as everybody knows, um, in the Caribbean. Um, and we were, when we were in St. Thomas, uh, one of the islands there, we were um, at a beach called Megan's Beach or Megan's Bay. And it's a completely isolated area. I mean, no cell coverage. It's a state park. Um, so basically, there's really nothing there in terms of civilization except a, rest, a little hut of a restaurant <laughs> and a couple of tourists that go there. So nothing else, just beach, sunshine, uh, tropical foliage all around you, sand, and you, and everything around you, all the, all the beautiful surroundings. So you are completely isolated, isolated. and I felt isolated. And I turned to my wife, we were laying on the beach on the sand, and I said, honey, don't you feel like you're a million miles away from everything? Doesn't it feel good to be so far away from everything? The moment I said that, I received a text. <laughs> a text. Where there's supposed to be no cell coverage. A text came through. I looked at it, and I looked at my wife, and I said, happiness gone. <laughs> because the moment that text came through, I began to, you know, worry about this and worry about that. What if something's going on and, and this and that? And all of a sudden, in spite of the beautiful surrounding that I was surrounded by, I lost my happiness. I lost my enjoyment. I lost the sense of isolation because of one text. I wanted to throw that phone into the ocean. See, that's what happens when we live our lives seeking happiness and not living out of the joy that God has for us. And that's where a lot of us are here today. We are seeking to be happy. We are looking for ways to be happy, okay? When instead, the Bible never promises us happiness. Have you ever noticed that? It never promises us happiness. It always promises us joy. Now, what is the difference between happiness and joy? Because, you know, you're probably thinking, oh, what is, there's no difference. No, there is a difference. There's a huge difference between what happiness is and what joy is. Let me give you some key differences, okay? 
First of all, happiness is a temporary feeling of satisfaction, while joy is a permanent feeling. So happiness is fleeting, it's temporal, it's never permanent, okay? Happiness belongs to material objects, while joy belongs to caring for others and gratitude and your faith. So happiness will come when circumstances are going your way. But what happens when it's not going your way? Then happiness is gone. Okay, so if you're depending and searching and seeking after happiness, you're going to live a fluctuating life, sort of like the stock market back in the early 90s. Okay, happiness belongs to earthly experiences while joy belongs to spiritual experiences. So if your life is surrounded and tied to everything that you see and do here on the face of the earth, now I don't want to sound spooky, but this is true, okay, um, you're going to be dependent upon what happens to you in the physical, in the natural earth. But if instead you focus and you build spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ, what's going to happen is you're going to build on something that's eternal, that's sure, that's permanent, which is the joy of the Lord. Okay? Happiness is from the outward expression of elation, while joy is from an inward peace. So happiness has all to do with outward expressions, while joy comes from a source within your spirit, man, within your heart, within your soul, that the Holy Spirit gives you and produces in you. Okay, so its source is different. Its source is not of this world. Its source is out of this world, this, through Jesus. Okay? Happiness is based upon outward circumstances, okay? And joy is based upon inward circumstances. There, and then again, it's all within you, okay? You may feel the joy anytime from your inside while happiness may come to you through external means at any time, okay? Happiness can be experienced from any activity or food while joy is present even when you're hungry, <laughs> Amen. As a matter of fact, Jesus was facing the most difficult times of his life while he was going to the cross. I mean, he was being condemned as a criminal when he wasn't a criminal. Okay? I, th I mean, think about what was going on around him and in his life, yet he still had joy. Amen. He didn't have happiness. He never relied on happiness. He depended upon the joy that comes from a relationship with the Father. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I believe that is one of the major reasons why he was able to endure. The Bible says he endured the cross with joy. So joy was there when he needed, and it gave him the strength to endure whatever he was going through. See, happiness will never give you strength for that. Because happiness, look at this. If joy and happiness were your friends, happiness will be the unfaithful one of the two. It's true. Because when you need to feel good, happiness is not there. It leaves you. You're feeling good on Monday, then all of a sudden you get bad news on Tuesday. Where's happiness when I need you? <laughs> it's your unfaithful friend. That's why you can't rely on happiness. But you can depend on the joy of the Lord. You can depend on joy that he gives to you which is permanent. Yes. <laughs> Can you say amen to that? Amen. So many of you here are living and you're relying on an unfaithful friend who is never there when you need him the most. He always abandons you when you face a, a tough situation. On Wednesday, you're feeling good. Thursday, you get a text and all of a sudden, where's the happiness? It's gone and left you. Why? Because he's unfaithful. But joy will always be there. Say it with me. Joy will always be with me. Now, this joy, it's important to know that this joy, like I said, does not come from outward circumstances. It's not of this earth. It has no origin of this earth. And let me give you some scriptures to back that up. It says in Romans 15, 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Notice carefully where it says, may the God of hope fill you with joy. May the God of hope, the God, who's God? The Father of Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with joy, all joy. So who fills us with joy? God does. Okay? God does. Second verse, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So number one, God is the one who gives us joy. Number two, joy is part of the kingdom of God. And number three, John 15, 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Number three, joy comes from believing and knowing God's words. Jesus' promises for us. So God is the one who gives us joy. Joy is part of the kingdom that we belong to as Christians. And number three, that joy can be to the full, to the max in our lives. A max experience as we read, as we believe the promises and the words of Jesus for us. Can you say amen to that? So that's the source of joy. The source of joy is not buying a new car, getting a promotion, getting a new girlfriend, getting married. You know, all these things bring happiness. It's not taking a vacation, going to the Caribbean or to Europe. All these things are great. They're, all, they're wonderful, but they're sources of happiness. Because you can be on vacation and be miserable. You can be married and be miserable. <laughs> Some people are trying to get married. Some people are trying to get, get away from their marriage. They're miserable. Okay? Why? Because marriage cannot bring joy. It has benefits, but it can't bring joy. It can only bring satisfaction and happiness and contentment, but nothing else. Make more money. Money doesn't bring joy. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Get a new job. New job doesn't bring joy. Has benefits, but it doesn't bring joy. Yeah. Move to a new neighborhood, to a new country, etc. Cetera, et cetera. There's so many things that you can think of that you can do that you feel will better your life, that will bring benefits, but it will never bring those benefits combined with joy. Because joy has no earthly origin. Amen. Amen. And when we say chasing Happiness, that's exactly what we mean. You're chasing something in this world that will finally bring contentment to your heart. And let me give you some, a news flash before it's too late for you. You're going to spend your whole life searching for something that will never truly satisfy you. That will give you only a fleeting moment of joy and contentment, but it will disappear just as fast as it came. And many of us have been living our whole lives that way. Always going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, looking for that place where we can finally say, I've arrived, I'm content, I'm secure, I'm full of joy, I'm restful. You'll never get to that place until you learn that it only comes from Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God the Father is the one who gives it. Amen. The, his kingdom is full of joy, and Jesus' words, his promises increases that experience of joy in your life. Period. Amen. Plus, the joy of the Lord, the Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10, is our strength. It says this, do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is our strength in Nehemiah 8.10. What does it mean by there? Well, God's joy strengthens us. It's the, um, it's the immune system against depression. It's the spiritual immune system against sadness, against giving up, against being weak unable to, to go through your life, to live your life every day. I mean, there's so many attacks that come into our soul, that come into our mind, the thoughts that bombard us, desires to quit, to give up, okay? Bible says joy, God's joy, gives us actual strength against those attacks. Amen. I've never seen a person who is full of joy wanting to give up on something. I've never seen a person that's full of joy depressed and gloomy and down. I've never seen it. Amen. Why? Because it's strength. It strengthens us. It does not allow those thoughts to take root into our minds and souls. You know, I don't have time to go into the, read the context, but 
This was a time when Israel had just come back from captivity, 70 years as slaves in Babylon. They had just returned to Jerusalem. Um, it's in the book of Nehemiah, so they were rebuilding. Okay? Um, and what happened was they were trying to convince themselves that they could do it, while at the same time facing opposition like crazy to stop rebuilding Jerusalem. So here they are trying to muster up some excitement, some enthusiasm, because they were 70 years away. Everything's, everything is demolished. Now they have to build from scratch. I mean, it's very difficult when you're trying to rebuild something that once existed and no, no longer is there. So can you imagine the psychological attacks? We're not going to do this. This is too difficult. We don't have the ability. We don't have the money. We don't have the natural resources. We don't have the workers, the laborers. We don't have anything. We can't. Can you imagine the attacks? Plus, you had other people whispering, trying to undermine the project. So all these attacks were coming. Can you imagine what they were facing? But they accomplished the test. They rebuilt the walls. And how did they do it? By continuing to do the work and by being strengthened with the joy of the Lord. So at a time when they were about to give up, Nehemiah says to them, this day is holy, do not grieve, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And they chose to believe the words of the prophet, and guess what? They finished the task. Joy was there to strengthen them and to help them not to give up but to continue with their task joyfully. I wonder what you're facing today. I wonder what you're going through. I wonder what you're going to have to deal with or what you're dealing with right now. Take the word of God and believe it. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit already abides in you, and you already have the joy of the Lord inside your life. Amen. 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 But oh, so then what do I have to do? I think you need to believe more of the words of Jesus, his promises for your life. <laughs> and let that take root. As that does, you're going to experience more and more of the joy that's already inside of you. Can you say amen? amen. So let's go back to Hebrews. Now, the background in Hebrews was basically the same thing. They were going through a lot of, a lot of uh, attacks. Okay? Um, why? Because they were Jewish Christians. And the Jewish community was attacking them like crazy. And they were on the brink of almost giving up. So that's why it says here that you must run with perseverance. The word perseverance means to continue even when the tough gets even tougher. So things were getting tougher for these Christians, these Jewish Christians, okay? And Paul gives them some key insights here of what we have to do practically in order for us to not lose the joy or even to strengthen the joy that God has already given us through the Holy Spirit, okay? Let's go to... Verse 1, it says, Therefore, since, in verse, uh, chapter 12, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. That everything that hinders here is referring to worries, cares, needless burdens of this world. In other words, if there's anything that is worrying you right now, you can take it to Jesus and lay it at his feet and leave it there. The Bible says, cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to fall. (laughs) Amen? Amen. So we need to understand that in order for us to preserve the joy or have that joy even increase in our lives, we must not carry these burdens. We must not carry cares. We must lay it at Jesus' feet. If something is worrying you right now, that means you are carrying it. But if your mind and your soul is free of worries and cares, then you have properly placed it at Jesus' feet. And sometimes it takes some practice. Sometimes it takes a continual laying at his feet because we have a tendency of taking it back. (laughs) Okay? So that's the first one. We need to um, throw off these hindrances, which are cares, worries, and burdens of this world. Okay? The next one, it talks about the sin that so easily entangles us. Okay? It's not talking about drunkenness or anger, bursts of anger, anything like that. There's a specific sin that he's talking about here, okay? And it is the sin of unbelief, the sin of not believing. How do I know that? Well, because in Hebrews 3.12, Hebrews 3.12, 
the writer here talks about and, and speaks to Israel. It says, See to it, brothers, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So the context of Hebrews, the whole context, the whole book is about Jewish Christians who were being tempted to turn away from God because of severe persecution. They were tempted not to believe or to let go of their belief. So this sin here is basically in times of trials, in times of trouble, instead of turning to Jesus and believing what he promised for you, you turn to other things to satisfy you. Okay? Then he says, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. In other words, immerse yourself with God's plan and purpose for your life, even within your problems, even, even while you're going through situations that are very difficult. Then fix your eyes on Jesus. Here I suggest turning your eyes away from other things and fixing them on Jesus. Get your eyes off of yourself. Get your eyes off of other people and circumstances and put them on Jesus. See, when we go through problems and, and trials, these are the last things that we do. Have you noticed we do the exact opposite? We carry our cares, okay? We stop believing what Jesus has to say about our problems, our, cir our circumstances, okay? We immerse ourselves, okay, not in what God has for us and, and, and is speaking to us, but we immerse ourselves in the problems that we're facing. We do the exact opposite. And the writer here is saying, no, you need to reverse that, <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to lose your joy, or you're, going to, you're not going to experience the joy that God has for you. You're going to search for circumstantial happiness and not joy. Okay? Then he says, the author and perfecter of our faith. He says, I mean, I, lo I love this part here where he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is our perfect example of faith perfect example, okay? He is what faith should look like because when he faced unsurmountable odds against him, difficulties, problems, circumstances that were all against him to destroy him, he remained steadfast, he remained connected, he remained stable, he remained secure, he remained trusting, he remained in faith. That's why he always had joy, okay? Now, what, what is the secret to this? What, what exactly did he do? This is key. Jesus didn't look to the cross, but he looked through the cross. Yes. Yes. He didn't look to the cross. In other words, the Bible says here that the cross brought shame to him. It brought scorning to him. It brought agony to him. Okay. He had to endure it. The Bible says he had to endure the cross. So when you endure something, you're not joyful <laughs> because of that, something that you're enduring. But instead, he had joy. So the cross, or he didn't look to the cross, because if you look to the cross, he would see pain. He looked through the cross. In other words, he saw what the cross that he would have to go through would eventually accomplish in his life. The results of the cross. Okay? Yes. That's what he saw. And so what did he see through the cross? He saw the church. He saw your lives. He saw you being saved. He saw your sins forgiven. He saw the establishment of a new kingdom, yes. a new era for, the, for planet Earth. So he, he saw your relationship with God restored. He saw all of this. And more. <laughs> he saw righteousness coming back to man. Amen. Amen. You saw your, you, you once again connected to the Father in relationship with the Father. He saw his church. So he saw all this and more. And, he's, and, and so he was looking through the cross. He wasn't looking to the cross. He was looking through the cross. You know, one little bit of advice that I want to give you here today, even more, <laughs> is that if, if you want to experience more of that joy in your life, joy of the Lord, Okay, first of all, you know where it comes from. It comes from the Father through Jesus. Okay, that's the source of joy. But in a practical way, every single day of your life, okay, as believers, just like Jesus looked through the cross and not to the cross, okay, you need to stop looking at your difficulties and start looking through your difficulties. Start seeing what the Father, through
through Jesus is accomplishing in your life. Amen. It's fulfilling in your life. Okay, nothing in our lives is ever wasted. Yes. Amen. Amen to that. Amen. Nothing. Even our mistakes, even our bad decisions, even the times where we forget where the source of joy comes from, even in those moments, God is working in that to teach us great and eternal lessons for us. He doesn't waste anything in our lives or any moment. Do you believe that, church? Amen. So let me finish with Romans 5, Romans 5, chapter 3, where it talks about that. Now, this should bring some joy back to your heart, okay? Because a lot of times we think that our lives are useless and that our mistakes could never, ever count for anything in our lives. Romans 3 Oh, 5 3, yes, 5 3. It says, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our, not for our sufferings, but in our sufferings. You understand the difference? Okay. In our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance. Now, perseverance is a key word here, which means patience. And what, does exact, what exactly does, does this mean? It means quiet endurance of what we cannot but wish to be removed. So perseverance, according to the Bible, um, basically means you trust God. It's a quiet strength. It's a standing still. It's, a, it's the ability to rest when you're tempted to go out and try to change the world in your strength. You know, I often used to believe that faith, strong faith, is seen, you know, in people that are doing so much in their lives and so much for Jesus. Yeah, there's a part of that because faith does express itself through works too. But there's another side of faith that I've begun to discover a few years ago that I, I, I couldn't see before. And that is that faith that leads us to this quiet trust that we know, that we know, that we know, that no matter what we go through, no matter what we face, God is with us, he is for us, and he will bring us through, and he will lead us out to the other side in victory. Amen. Glory to God. I don't need to stay up at night worrying about it. I don't need to pray 24-7. I can just rest and trust and go on with my life in peace. Not ignoring the problem. This is not ignoring the problem, walking away. This is actually within the problem, but with a heart that is fixed and trusting fully in what Jesus can do, and not what I can do. Amen. 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 When you get to that place, which is a place that God has brought me to, you know, a lot of times Satan will try to get me out of that place. But now I am more accustomed to being there than being someplace else. When you get to that place, you're going to see that the joy of God, the joy of the Lord, will not be easily stolen from you. You know, my wife, I was surprised when she came to me um, a few days ago, when uh, right after Trump won the election, and he was beginning to lay out what he is going to be doing in the first 100 days, um, and she said, and he said that one of the things that he has vowed to change is um, Obamacare. He wants to get rid of Obamacare. And for a lot of people, they say that Obamacare is a, tr is, 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 a, is, a, is a bad thing and all that. But for us, it was a blessing. Amen. It blessed us so much. Amen. And so, I mean, my wife, she, went, she had surgery last year, which cost almost $200,000. You know, they paid it all. I don't know what I would have done if I had that bill. <laughs> Lost my joy. <laughs> joy gone. Happiness gone. No, no, no not really. <laughs> the happiness, yes, would have been gone. Out the window, brother. Not the joy. But uh, it would have been difficult. Very, I don't know. It would have been very difficult. So with all these changes that are, they, they are threatening to do, you know, I saw her get a little worried. But then she came to me and she said, you know what, honey? God provided for us when we least expected it last year. We, did, we, were, we weren't even searching for it, but because he knew that we would need it, 
even when we didn't have a clue what was going to happen a few months later. Okay? Therefore, I can trust him now. Amen. That no matter what changes, what law changes, what is out, what is in, no matter what happened, we know that he's got us, that he's caring for us. And in the end, he's always going to give us the best, exactly what we need. So, honey, I'm okay. I'm fine. Are you okay? Yeah, sure. If you're okay, then I'm okay. Okay, then we're all okay. Then let's move on with our lives. Let's enjoy our lives. Let's enjoy our relationships. Let's enjoy Jesus. And let's leave all this in Jesus' hands as always. And we go about our lives and we don't even think about it. That's a quiet trust. It's saying, Lord, I trust you enough to believe you that you're going to do things for us and change things that we can't change, that we can't predict. And that applies to every other area of your life. There are areas, there's almost every area of your life that you can't change, that you can't predict things about to happen tomorrow, next week, next month. See, that's where the quiet trust comes in. That's perseverance. You persevere, you continue every single day, re rejoicing in peace, resting, because you know Jesus is watching over you, is caring for you, and will meet every single need of your life. Can you say amen? amen. In character, he says, <clears throat> Perseverance, 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 character. You know, character here is basically the way someone feels and behaves. Once, once we learn to trust Jesus in, 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 in everyday issues, we persevere, guess what happens? It changes us. We become meek, pleasant people. We're no longer agitated, angry, nervous, confused, anxious. It, it affects even the way we behave. It affects us. It begins to change us. We become peaceful people, loving, kind people, patient people, soft, tender, because we know we're being taken care of. We trust that. It changes us. Hallelujah. Amen. So it, it even changes our character. It changes the way we behave, the way we express ourselves. Some of us desperately need that. Even one author said, when it comes to character, another aspect of this, it's a proof that you're truly saved. It's a proof that you're truly saved. Amen? Because God's changing you, transforming you. His power is doing it. And the next one, the last one is hope. After perseverance, okay, Character, character, hope. And hope, verse uh, 5, does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. This hope here is not unfounded optimism. Okay? It's not, un I mean, it's, like, it's not like, oh, I hope I get a raise tomorrow. That's unfounded optimism because nothing can guarantee it. Or I hope I get this. Or I hope I get married. Or I hope I get a new job. Or I hope... I get better help. These are all hoping, but it's, un, un, it's unfounded because it has no guarantee behind it. The hope that he's referring to here is not unfounded optimism. It is guaranteed by, guess what? The love of God. That's why he says, I'll read it again, because God and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love. Now, why is love the guarantee? Because it is the basis, okay, it is the basis of everything that God does for us. He loved us when we couldn't even love him. Today, we still don't love him like he deserves, and yet he still loves us. So everything that he did for us and does for us is motivated by his love. And keep this in mind, it's a one-way love. In other words, you, even though you may not love him as you should, he continues to love you. Why? Because he doesn't depend on you loving him for him to love you back. He loves you regardless. The reason why he sent Jesus is because he loves you. As a matter of fact, you want to know why he loves you? want to know that he loves you? He says, the Holy Spirit has been poured into your heart. You have the Holy Spirit. Okay. And number two, it's demonstrative. Jesus went on the cross and died for you. So he proves it that he loves you by giving you the Holy Spirit when you don't deserve it and by giving you Jesus on the cross when you least deserve it as well. 
So today you can say, I am full of hope that one day I'll be in heaven. I'm full of hope that he will care for me tomorrow. I can be full of hope that I'm going to be okay next week. I can be full of hope that I'm going to be fine next year. But that hope is founded upon his love for me, which never diminishes. It's always there. Amen. I may be facing the worst crisis in my life, but I can hope that tomorrow he will be there. He will hold me. He will lead me through. He will rebuild my life. Because, know why? Because he loves me. And he will never change his mind about his love for me. He chose to love me. Not because of what I can give in return, but because what he desired to demonstrate and to reveal to me of himself. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why I can say I am hopeful. I can believe in my tomorrow. I can believe in my today. I can believe. Why? Because it's founded upon the love of God for me. Upon the love of God for you. Hallelujah. Amen. So, you know, if you're here today, you know, and, and I, I hope this word, this message spoke to you. I hope, I hope it, it, it really touched your heart. Because you can leave here today spending the rest of your life searching for fleeting happiness. Searching for things that will make you feel better and happier and, and more in control and more secure and, and more in, in this bliss that you're looking for. And you're, gonna, and you're gonna discover just like you have experienced in the past, that you're gonna be like the stock market, you're gonna be like a yo-yo up and down, you're gonna be up and down. At times you're gonna be more down than up. And I've met some people that have been down all their lives. They've rarely experienced moments of happiness because of all the tragedies that they went through. That's happiness and keep this in mind, leave this here knowing that if you live this way, you are depending and relying on an unfaithful friend who will leave you the moment you need him the most. Or you can leave here knowing that there is another way to live. <laughs> there is another source that you need. His name is Jesus. And through him, you can have not just happiness, because you also get happiness, but you can have something even greater, something eternal, something permanent. It's called joy. That joy will be your strength. That joy will be there with you, will be permanent. It will guard you. It will sustain you. And it comes from a source that is not of the earth. Jesus, the Father, is the source. And, and through that, you can live every day strong in strength. Even if you go through big problems, circumstances that are beyond your ability to handle, you'll still be strong, in control, full of joy. I mean, Peter... Um, was in prison in the book of Acts. He was going to be tried the next day and most likely put to death. And yet in prison, he began to sing songs of joy. <laughs> in prison, he began to worship. And the Bible says the, there was an earthquake and he was let out of prison and he was saved. You can imagine, there shackled up knowing that he's going to be tried the next day and most likely condemned to die. And yet, he had a song in his heart. <laughs> because he had joy. Because joy has nothing to do with external. External things has to do with internal. Your relationship with Jesus. So, do you receive this today? <laughs>